Welcome back. In our last video, we talked about the various generations of programming languages, from first generation machine language up through fourth or fifth generation, wherever you consider we are now. But I mentioned that most programmers do most of their programming in third generation languages, and most of the applications programs that you use are done with third generation languages. So we're going to take a look by peeking at a couple of third generation languages and seeing some of the syntax that you would write to do simple little programs in those languages. And from that, figure out what are the types of things you might have to do in all languages. This is just an overview. This is not teaching you how to become a programmer in one particular language, because that's more than a 10 minute video, believe me. And you'll get into it in one of the assignments. But let's just get an overview of a couple of languages. Okay, here we go. All right, I've selected Python and Java as the two languages that I'm going to use to illustrate third generation language concepts. Now, why did I pick Python and Java? Here's some reasons. They're two of the languages that are used most extensively today by both professional programmers and hobbyists. They're ones that are learned often. They're ones that are taught in colleges. They're ones that are taught in online tutorials. They're ones that a lot of people know. They exemplify the types of features that are available in most third generation languages. And probably the most selfish reason is I happen to know these two pretty well. I know a lot of languages. These are the two I've been using the most in recent years. So I'm uh, quite familiar with what might be going on with these. So let's see what's happening with Python and Java. One of the things that has to be done in languages, and it, the syntax for it might be done differently, is that we've got variables in a computer language. Variables are places in memory that can contain data. And we know what name we as the programmer want to use to refer to it. Now, in some languages, like Java, you have to explicitly declare every variable you're going to use. In Python, you don't have to explicitly declare it, but it happens anyway the first time you use a variable. So let's look at something in Java. This left-hand column has some code that would be a subset of a Java program. It says int x. That means, hey, computer, in this program, I'm going to use a variable that I want to call x. And what I want you to do is get me enough space in memory so that it can handle however much room an integer, an int, takes. Most computers, that's going to be 32 bits. OK, so when I do int x, it reserves some memory for me that will be used for nothing else except calling a variable x. It doesn't have a value in it yet. Then when I say x equals 7, the computer compiler will go in and say, oh, x, yeah, you told me about that. That's an int, and I know where I've stored it. Oh, I'm going to put a value of 7 in, in whatever format this computer uses for integers. I can combine statements like this to say int y equals 23. This will declare a variable if this is the first time I've used it. And it'll say, oh, computer, give me enough room for an integer. And I'm going to call it y. Oh, and by the way, put an initial value of 23 in it. Not everything has to be an int. I could do something like double price equals 2.35. In Java, double is the data type for floating point numbers, numbers that could include um, a decimal portion. They don't have to just be integers. And these are called double precision floating point numbers, but the syntax for Java just says double. What happens here? Some space in memory, enough space for a double, and that's most likely going to be 64 bits on most computers, will be called price. So from now on in the program, anytime I say price, it goes to that spot. And I'm putting a value in 2.35.
And then I'm going to do something that says, hey, give me a string and I'm going to call my variable name. And let's start out with the character string mr period space i. Well, unlike integers and double precision, I don't know how long a string should be, and neither does the computer. All I know is the string might be kind of short like this, but suppose I said Mr. Ingracia instead of Mr. I. Then it would take more letters. So we'll see how that's handled in a moment. You see this white space here? There's a reason for it. I'm going to pop up a picture in a second. Now here's how I would do, how I would do the exact same thing in Python. x equals 7. I didn't have to say x is an integer. Python says, hey, the value that you're putting into x is an integer, I'll make it an integer. Oh, the value you're putting into y is 23, that's an integer, I'll make this an integer. The value you're putting into price is a floating point number, I'll make it a double precision floating point number. The value you're putting into name is a character string, I'll make it a string variable. In Java, in Python, different syntax. Notice in Java, I've got lots and lots of semicolons. I don't have them in Python. So what's happening in memory? Well, let's say this big rectangle is all the memory that's available to your program. Now, there's all sorts of things in memory that we're not going to look at. But when I say int x and x equals 7, or in Python, when I say x equals 7, it says, I'm going to reserve this part of memory. Can't be used for anything else except what you're going to call x. And right now, I'll put in the value 7. Now, it's really stored in zeros and ones because our computers are binary computers. But it'll put in the binary equivalent of the number 7. And it'll find however much room it needs for an int y, and it'll put in 23. And it'll find out how much room it needs for a double precision floating point number. It'll put in 2.35. And notice it's doing something different with the string. It takes enough room for it to put another memory address in. So I've got some indirection going here. I have enough room to put a memory address in. That could be 32 bits. It could be 64 bits. Depends on what operating system you're running. And I'll reserve that much room, call it by the variable name, name. And what's going to get stored in there is not the value Mr. I, but a pointer, an address, to where I have enough room to put Mr. I. And notice here I've shown I've got the letter M, the letter R, a period, a space, the letter I, a period, and then what I've indicated with backslash zero. Something that isn't a printable character at all. It's just zeros that's only used to terminate a string. So when the program's running and you have to use name, it says, oh, I know where it starts right here. And I know where it stops because it's wherever I'm going to see the next one of these. <coughs> Okay, let's go on. What's the point of having variables if you can't do something with them? So let's extend our example. In Java, the left-hand column, I start out int x equals 7, int y equals 23, int z, which doesn't have a value yet. <coughs> so I've got three spaces in memory that I can call x, y, and z. Two of them have values in it. One of them is about to get a value. What's the value? z equals 3 times x plus 2 times y. So 3 times 7 is 21. 2 times 23 is 46. Add those up, I get a 67. So a 67 will be stored in z. x still has a 7. y still has a 23. z now has a 67. Now, I can change the value of y if I want. I can say y will be assigned a new value equal to whatever y currently is plus 1. So y started out at 23. After this statement, y will have a value of 24. Notice that's not going to change the value of z. Even though z was built <coughs> by using the values of x and y, once the value goes into z, there's no more connection to y. z has the value of, what did we say, 67? And it's still going to be 67 until I change z. But y is now going to be 24. And another way I can do this in Java, I can say y 
plus equals 1. That means the exact same thing as the, one, the line above. So it's going to say, hey, y, whatever your value is, make it 1 bigger. So my value had already been incremented to 24. After this statement, it's 25. Now here's another one, y plus plus. This means the same thing as the previous two. It says take the value of y, add 1 to it. So y started out as 23. After this statement, it's 24. After this statement, it's 25. After this statement, it's 26. This is something, this plus plus, is something you can do in Java. You can do it in some other languages too. That doesn't work in Python, but it works, for example, in the programming language C. And I'll bet you guys have heard of a programming language called C++. That's sort of a, a programmer geek joke. It means one more than C. Hey, here's a programming language that's one better than C. A little bit better than C, we'll call it C++. And if you knew C, then you would laugh. And if you didn't know C, you'd say, what a stupid name. Well, now you know. Okay, Python. How do we do exactly the same thing here? x equals 7, y equals 23, z equals 3 times x plus 2 times y. Same as we did over here, but notice I don't have a semicolon. y equals y plus 1. We'll add 1 to whatever the current value of y is. y plus equals 1. We'll add 1 to whatever the value of y is. But you can't do a y plus plus in Python. OK, some input output. Wow, one of the things you're going to notice, and those of you who are taking AP Computer Science this year, I know several of you are, or several of you took it last year, input-output in Java is not very straightforward. So, suppose I want to have somebody type in at the keyboard what the value of x is, and then print out what the value of x is. How I do that in Java? Scanner console equals new scanner system dot in semicolon. Yeah, I'm not going to parse that out for you. I've got a variable called console that has what I need to hook it up to the keyboard. OK, then I do system dot out dot print, enter a value for x. This will print out on whatever the default output device is, probably the screen on a computer. It'll print out enter value for x. And then I do string x and instead of doing something like equals quote Mr. I quote, I do console.next. See console was this variable I created up here. So it's saying get the next token. The next thing that somebody types in up until they hit enter or put a space in or something like that. So what gets printed out on the screen, enter a value for x. This line will wait until you type something in. And maybe you'll type in Mr. I. Maybe you'll type in hello, have a nice day. Maybe you'll type in rutabaga. Then it'll print out system.out.println will print out the value of x is and whatever value was just read in. And then they'll move to a new line. Now, how do we do the same thing in Python? x equals input, enter value for x, print, value of x is x. A lot easier to do simple I.O. in Python. OK, another thing we can do with programs, instead of always executing one statement after another, after another, after another, in the order that the programmer wrote them, we might want to do something that depends on the values of the data. You know, if, it, if you've got more than a certain amount of money in your bank account, maybe the program that's running the display on the ATM gives you different options than if you have less than that amount. Maybe you can't make a withdrawal unless you have at least $200 in your account. Okay, so in Java, let's say I have a variable called x that starts out with a value of 7. Then I do if x is less than or equal to 6, do something. Here I put slash slash do something just to say, here's where I would put other code, but I'm not bothering to show it to you. This is just a comment that a programmer can put in to leave a note for herself or himself. 
Now, that, that something might be printing something out, it might be doing some arithmetic, it might be asking for more money, more information, it might be going to a database, uh, anything. If some condition that can be evaluated is either true or false, then I open a curly brace, and whatever's between the opening curly brace and the next closing curly brace will get done. Else, open a curly brace, close the curly brace, and whatever is in here. So, in this example, since x has a value of 7, is x less than or equal to 6? No, it isn't. So it won't do this. It'll jump down here and do this code. Now, how do I do the same thing in Python? x equals 7. If x is less than or equal to 6, colon, not a semicolon like I used a lot of in Java, colon, and then do something. Here the hashtag sign or the sharp sign or the pound sign, whatever you want to call it, is the way in Python you say this is a comment. So I could have several statements here. Else, colon, several statements here. Now you notice I've indented in both of these. In Java the indenting is only for aesthetic purposes. The Java compiler ignores all indenting. It says you have a starting brace and you have a closing brace. All of the statements in between, no matter how you indent them, are part of what you do if x was less than or equal to 6. All of the statements in between this starting brace and this ending brace would happen if x wasn't less than or equal to 6. In Python, the indenting matters. If x less than or equal to 6, colon, Everything that's indented underneath that until I have something that's not indented anymore is what happens when x is less than or equal to 6. And everything under else that's indented happens whenever x is not less than or equal to 6 until the next time I have a statement that's not indented. So Java most people choose to indent because it's easier for the human to read, but it doesn't make any difference. Python, the indenting absolutely makes a difference in the way the code is executed. Okay, what's another thing we can do in a program? One of the reasons we use computers is they can do the same thing over and over again much faster than a human can. So here's a, a couple of ways to do a loop in Java. You can re execute code repeatedly either for a fixed number of times. Hey, I want to do this 10 times. Or you can do it until a certain thing happens. Keep doing this until the user types in quit. Keep doing this until the door to the dungeon opens. Keep doing this until the balance in your checking account is less than zero. So there's a for loop in Java and a while loop in Java. How does the for loop work? For int n equals 0, n less than 10, n plus plus, this three-part statement inside the parentheses says, start out by making a variable n equals 0. And if you haven't declared n somewhere else, you have to declare it here. So we're making it an integer. Keep doing this loop as long as n is less than 10. And at the end of each time through the loop, add 1 to n. So this will do whatever is between this opening curly brace and this closing curly brace. It'll do it the first time through, the variable n will have a value of 0. The next time through, it'll have a value of 1. The next time through, it'll have a value of 2, and so on. The last time it does it, it'll have a, va a value of 9. Because then it'll add one more. And it'll say, oh, n isn't less than 10 anymore. So I'm going to go to the next statement after the loop. So this will do a loop 10 times, where n has the values 0 to 9. Here I've got another variable uh, that I'm going to initialize to 0. x is going to be 0. And then I've got a loop while x is less than 10. Do something. Well, part of what you're doing in there bet better change the value of x so that eventually it won't be less than 10 anymore. Otherwise, you've got an infinite loop. And yeah, programmers write these all the time. They're a bug. Your program never stops. It just runs forever. 
It's a bad thing. Don't ever do it, but you will. I still do it sometimes, but I know what to look for. If a program's running much longer than I think, I check to see. Did I have any while loops where I never gave it a way to get out of the loop? Okay, how do I do something similar in Python? Python also has for loops and while loops. Here I'm saying for n in range 10. There's other ways to do this statement. Here's just one of them. Range 10 gives me the numbers 0 through 9. So this says let n start at 0 and each time through the loop, and the loop is all the statements that are indented underneath 4. For n is 0 the first time through, n is 1 the next time through, n is 2 the next time through, and the last time through will be 9. Here I'm going to do something almost exactly like I did in Java. x starts at 0 while x is less than 10. Everything indented under that while will happen. Hopefully I've got something in there that will change the value of x so sometime it will be greater than or equal to 10. And once that happens, I'll skip to wherever the indenting stops after the while loop. Now there's an awful lot more. Third generation languages have a lot, a lot more features than we've shown. After all, you can take a year-long class from GOA in learning how to code in Java and you won't have learned everything. You can take a semester-long class in coding in Python, and you won't have learned everything. Those of you that are taking AP Computer Science, you're learning Java. It's a year-long class. You won't have learned everything. They have more features than we've shown. Some of the things that are important, an ability to store code as a named unit, call one unit from another, so you can do part of your program and maybe another coworker does part of a program, or you do some of it today, you do some of it tomorrow. Has many more data types than what we've talked about. And some third generation languages, but not all, are object oriented. Both Java and Python are, which means that the programmer can create a class of objects that all have the same types of data in them and the same operations you can do with them. Now, it takes a long time to explain object-oriented, and we're not really going to get into it in this video. But just be aware, there's a lot more to learning a language. So what are you going to do about this? You've got an assignment coming up that says, pick a language and learn something more about it. If you don't know any Python at all, you can go to the Code Academy site and go through all of the Python tutorial. It'll take you a while. You need to start this long before the last day of the assignment. And that's also why you've got three weeks for this unit instead of two. If you've never used JavaScript, and for those of you that have learned Java, JavaScript is different. So you may have learned Java but never used JavaScript. If you've never used JavaScript, you can go through the Code Academy JavaScript tutorials. If you already know either Python or Java and you don't want to go through a different language in Code Academy and learn the beginning stuff of another language, you want to show some more advanced knowledge of either Java or Python, then you can do the other option in that assignment, which is to go to the coding.bat website where there are lots of exercises for, okay, write a program that does this. Now write a program that does this. And you write it and it gets tested right there and you can see if it worked. And you would have to do 12 of those and prove to me that you got 12 of them right. So. Go back, take a look at this stuff when you need to, but you're going to learn a lot more. You need to learn programming. you got to actually write little programs. And both the Code Academy site and the Coding.bat site will give you an opportunity to do that. Happy programming!